time in your life when you were just running a rat race trying to figure out how to get through life, how to figure things out. Aren't you thankful for the day that you came to know Christ as your Savior? I praise the Lord for that tonight. I'm glad to be saved. I want you to take your Bibles, turn over to Hebrews chapter 7 tonight. Hebrews chapter 7. We're continuing looking here in our study of Hebrews. I've enjoyed studying Hebrews. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. It's been a great study. We've got a whole lot more we're going to be looking at. We're literally tonight on part 18 of 48, so we've got a whole lot more to look at, some wonderful truths we're going to enjoy. I'd encourage you to take notes and, and mark things down as we delve in. This is a wonderful truth that we can get from God's Word. Look at there in Hebrews chapter 7. <clears throat> look at verse number 1. Actually, look, look at um, the, the previous chapter, chapter 6, verse number 20. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. 
For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of days, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarchs Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people, according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of him, uh, uh, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may say, uh, say so, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father, whom Melchizedek met him. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word tonight. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. I pray, Lord, that we might learn from this passage of Scripture. Lord, help the Holy Spirit, I pray, to speak to us. I pray that you'd have free course in this place. Lord, help me as I'm empowered by your Holy Spirit to speak the exact words. Lord, I pray that we might listen. Lord, that we might learn. Lord, that we might not be in darkness, but Lord, that you would open our eyes to see truth. Speak to us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is going to be a three-week study on this chapter. We're going to be looking at it, breaking it down for uh, three weeks. We could have just summarized the whole chapter. There's too many good things in here. I, I think that if you're here tonight, you're a mature Christian, you want to grow, you want some meat, not just wanting just milk all the time, but this is going to be some meat and potatoes we're going to be looking at. We're going to be delving into it. We're going to be studying it. And it's a wonderful chapter from God's Word, one that is often misunderstood, but we're going to try to, as the Holy Spirit would lead, lead and give us understanding, uh, delve into it and get what God has for us. And so we've been moving toward this particular subject since all the way back to chapter uh, 5 and verse number 10. It had been reiterated for us in the last verse of chapter number 6 as we read tonight. Now we come to chapter 7, the subject is at hand, the subject is at hand is Melchizedek. I'm calling this Melchizedek 1, next Sunday night will be Melchizedek 2, and the following Sunday night will be Melchizedek 3, it's easy, it's not hard to name this one tonight, so if you're taking notes you can write that down, Melchizedek 1, it's really easy for us. So we're going to go through, now this Melchizedek that we're talking about, that we're going to be looking at, he was a king, he was a king of righteousness, he was also a king of peace, very interesting. He was not the Son of God, but like unto the Son of God, is what God's Word says. Like unto the Son of God. He is a picture of an aspect of the life and the ministry of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, this is heavy stuff. This is some deep stuff. But I would encourage you to stay plugged into it learn from it. It's good stuff. Keep in mind that the writer of Hebrews he has his central thesis is this, that Jesus Christ is better in every possible way. Over and over again, we've been looking at that. It just keeps getting better is the overall theme of our entire study of the book of Hebrews. And so his purpose for writing the book of Hebrews primarily Primarily is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, to lift him up. In fact, the key word to the book of Hebrews is the word better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. In the course of, he, uh, of this book, he has said that Jesus, number one, is better in his person, if you remember. He was better than the angels. He was better than Moses. Why was he better than Moses? Well, Moses was a sinner just like we are. Jesus Christ was sinless. Jesus Christ never sinned. But another truth about the Lord Jesus Christ is this new economy of Christianity is that Jesus is a better priest. He is a better priest, not only a better person, but a better priest. Now the Jews would hear that and they would say, now hang on a minute. You're teaching us that Jesus was a priest? Now you think about that. They would have said, now listen, did he ever go into the temple? I'm talking about the temple that was built by man here on earth. No, he never went into the temple. Did he ever take animal sacrifices and put them on the altar? The answer to that would be, no, he never did that. They might ask the question, did he ever go into the holiest place and work around the table and trim the lampstands and put incense on the altar of incense? No, he never did that would be the answer. They might ask the question, did he ever go within the veil and put the blood of the lamb on the mercy seat out there over the Ark of the Covenant? 
The answer would be no, here on earth he never did that. So what is this business then you're saying about Jesus Christ as a priest? Can you imagine them asking that question? They would have understood all of that. They would have asked the question, well, well, well listen, what tribe was he from? Well, he wasn't from the tribe of Levi. They would say, well, then how could he be, I mean, a priest? He had to have been from the tribe of Levi. He had to have been from the order of Aaron, but he was not. So how could you say he was a priest? Well, what tribe was he from then? You all remember? Judah. Well, he's from the tribe of Judah. We don't have priests that come from the tribe of Judah. It's not possible for Jesus Christ to be a priest. He's from the wrong tribe. And then we come to the place now where the writer of Hebrews, which is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, he literally drops the bombshell on them. He says there, the writer of Hebrews, he says that all the way back in chapter 5 and, and verse number 10, he says that Jesus is called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Here's that bomb explodes and it, it completely gets a hold of their attention, their mind, and they're trying to go through all this and trying to figure this all out in their mind. It hits them and they'd never even thought about this, that Jesus was not a priest after the order of Aaron. That is what the earthly priesthood was after. Rather, Jesus, though, is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. We're talking about this, why? Explaining the reason why they, th this was so important for them to understand. They had to understand who Jesus was. Hey, listen, for a person to become a child of God, they have to understand who Jesus is. They have to understand who he is and what he does. For us to grow as a child of God, we need to understand who Jesus is to us. These Hebrews, they would have not understood what the writer of Hebrews was talking about. Remember, he said they were dull of hearing, they needed to grow. Now he's trying to help them to grow. He's now giving that, after giving the great warning passes, the challenge for them to grow. And us as Christians, we've been warned that we need to grow and challenge that we need to hear. And we understand that Jesus Christ, he is a, a God, called him a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is the, after the order of Melchizedek? Well, who is Melchizedek? And so when you search through the Bible and you look for Melchizedek, you find out that he's mentioned only three times in the Bible. Three different times. You might, you might want to jot these down. We're going to be talking about them again next week. Three different places in the Bible. You can put these references down here in a moment. But Melchizedek, if you look in the Bible, he literally was a mysterious character. By the way, people who say the Bible is, is really boring, they haven't read the Bible a whole lot. The Bible's not boring at all. You like romance? You find it in the Bible. You like mysteries? You're going to find it in the Bible. As a matter of fact, we're talking about a mystery tonight, Melchizedek. A mysterious man. What a mystery. He just appears on the pages of Scripture in, in Genesis chapter 14 is the first time he's mentioned. You can write that down. Put down Genesis chapter 14. We're going to come to that in just a minute. And then he just suddenly disappears and so much time goes by. Centuries go, go by. You don't hear about him anymore. And then all of a sudden in Psalm chapter 110 is the next passage of Scripture. You find Melchizedek mentioned by David. He mentions his, him there just out of the clear blue. And then he disappears once again. And for years and centuries, they go by. There's no mention of Melchizedek. And you go all the way down. You get to the writer of Hebrews and all the way down to chapter number 5. And all of a sudden, boom, there he is again talking about Melchizedek. So you have three mentions of Melchizedek in the Bible. The first mention is Genesis chapter 14. That is the historical mention. You might want to write that down next to that. Genesis chapter 14, the historical mention of Melchizedek. He's mentioned as a real person in history there in chapter 14 of Genesis. And then in Psalm 110, he's mentioned, and that is the prophetical mention of him. A prophetical mention of Melchizedek. David takes that character who actually lived and existed in history. He uses him as a prophetical picture of the coming Messiah. It's a picture of Jesus Christ coming as the Messiah. And then here in Hebrews chapter 7, you have the practical or doctrinal mention of Melchizedek that we're reading tonight. And his whole purpose is to show that Jesus Christ has a superior priesthood than the earthly priests did in the, the line of the Levites, in, in the line of the Levite priests. And because he is not after the order of Levi or Aaron, he is better. He, he is after, not after the order of Aaron or Levi, but after the order of Melchizedek. Now look at chapter 7, if you would, once again there in our text tonight. Verse number 3, notice what it says there. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God. He was made like unto the Son of God. 
Now that doesn't mean that he was the Son of God. It says he was made like. If it was Jesus Christ, it would have said he was the Son of God. But it says he was made like under the Son of God. He was like him. If you want to write this down in your notes, write down type. Type. I'm not talking about computer typing either. We're talking about a type of Christ. A type, a picture of, might be another word you might use. A picture of Christ in the Old Testament. Throughout the Old Testament, you can see types of Christ over and over and over again. We can see pictures of Christ again and again throughout the Old Testament. There are types and pictures of what was going to happen when Jesus came in the New Testament. Let me give you an example of that. In the Old Testament, when a lamb was laid on the altar and slain, that lamb was a type or a picture of who? Help me out tonight. Jesus Christ. When John saw Jesus coming, what did he say? He said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. All those lambs, all those sacrifices in the Old Testament were a picture of Jesus Christ. Were a picture of Christ to come. The Lamb was a pre-picture of Jesus. Are you with me tonight? You understand that? All right. And so Melchizedek was a type or a pre-picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't Christ himself, but he was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a pre-picture of Lord Jesus. And so it doesn't mean that Melchizedek didn't live, though. He did live. He was mentioned in history. We're going to be looking at that further in just a moment. But it means that his priesthood, the priesthood, this priesthood of Melchizedek, is a pre-picture of the kind of priesthood the Lord Jesus Christ has. His point is that Jesus is superior than the priests. He is better than the priests. He is greater than them. And there are two matters in these verses I want for us to look at tonight. First of all, I want you to see the matter, number one, of titles. Titles. We're going to look at the titles here tonight. In the first three verses, he discusses the matter of titles of Melchizedek and the titles of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look there in verse number one, if you would. Verse one again, it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met with Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. That's a reference to Genesis chapter 14. By the way, I want you to use your Bible. All right, Look at your Bible when I'm referring to it. Most scripture will not be on the screen when we're in our meet session. Are you all with me? When we're in our meet session, use your Bible. All right? I'm not, I don't want to spoon feed you. I put a lot of verses up on the screen when, when it's time when we have people here that are drinking milk. But when we're in the meat section, get your Bibles out. Bring them with you. It's important, all right? Just a side note, help you out there. All right, so we see here a reference in, in chapter 7 and verse number 1 literally is referencing all the way back to Genesis chapter 14, the first mention of Melchizedek in the Bible. Here's the story. Let me summarize it for you. You can read the whole chapter later on if you'd like. A lot of wonderful names in the chapter. I'm not going to care to try to read tonight. But you can go back there and, and read them. And, and uh, it's a wonderful story. Let me just summarize it for you. Some kings around Abraham, they carried on a raid. They got together. They carried out a raid. They, they raided Abraham's surrounding cities that were around him. They literally attacked a part of his family. They took some captives. They took some property and some animals. By the way, you better watch out when you pick on the Israelites. Look out when you attack God's people. Mark it down. Anybody that's opposed to God's people, I don't want to be counted with them. I don't want to be one that put a notch on, my, on, on their card saying, I'm for that guy. Judgment's going to come down on you. Mark my words. Why? Because God's word says so. Don't be on the wrong, wrong side. Be on the winning side. All right? Don't be opposed to God's people. Does that mean that God's people are perfect? Everybody say no. Does that mean, though, we ought to be on their side? Yes, because they're God's chosen people. God will take care of them. God will judge them. All right. Now, understanding that, here's a situation where a bunch of heathen kings thought they would pick on a bunch of heathen people, but it mixed those heathen people were some of God's people as well. All right. They came in there. They attacked. They took some things, and they, they took some property. They took some people that were captive. Does anybody remember one person in particular they took captive? Does anybody want to take a guess? Lot. That's exactly right. What was his relation to Abraham? His nephew. In that chapter, it talks about the fact that he was the son of his brother, and then later it references him as his brother. That's talking about the way Hebrews would have thought about things. He's my brother. He's part of my family. That's the way they would have referenced it. It's not a contradiction. All right? Understand that. All right, so he went, and, and so they went in there, they took, and, and they took the property. They took those captives. And now we see Abraham, what does he do? He organizes a group of commandos. I'm told you I'm putting it in my own words and summarizing it. 318 of them. You see that in Genesis chapter 14 and verse number 14. Here they are, there's armed and trained servants. 
That was that maybe you might say the Navy SEALs team. I mean, they're going to go in and get uh, Bin Laden. No, not Bin Laden. It was those kings, whatever their names were. Something like that, though. Some unusual name. But here they were. They pursued those men that had those kings and their men. They pursued them unto Dan. That is, they, they took off after them, and they had this little small band. There they are, they're pursuing after them. Can you see the camels as they're, they're going, and they can hear the, the different animals of the, the opposing army in, the, in their camp. And as they're there with them, in that small band, they come up to them at a nighttime. They come upon these three kings, and they suddenly attack them. They suddenly take them by surprise. Did they have victory? Yes, they had victory. They conquered them. Yeah, they, 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 listen, they, they took them and they got them and, and they got the prisoners. They set them free. They took back all that was taken and Lot was one of them that was set free. And now on the way back, it says in verse number 17 of Genesis chapter number 14, in verse 17, it, it says there, I'm not going to read it right now, but Abraham, you'll see there in that verse, he's met by two kings. Now pay attention to this. He's met by two different kings. The first king, it's very interesting, pay attention. He is met by the king of Sodom. The king of Sodom. Does anybody know what Sodom is associated with? Sodomy? Is that would be a, a king that you'd probably say is probably a wicked, vile king? Sodom. Here's the king of Sodom. He comes up to him, talks with him. He is met by him. In verse 21, it says there that, that, that the king of Sodom says, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. All right, give me the people that were held captive that came from my city. If you'll just give me the captives, you can keep all the spoils that you had. All the things that you won from winning that victory. By you going and fighting, I'm going to award you. Just give me the people. It's interesting. And he's saying to Abraham, Abraham, literally, this is bottom line. He says, Abraham, I want you to be a taker in life. Now grasp this concept. I know I'm, I'm pulling some things out from this that we can apply practically to our life. He's basically saying to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to be a taker. I want you to be a taker in life. And, and, and so, it, it, listen, we need to understand this, this, this application. Every day of our life, we are met with two kings, the king of Sodom and the king of Salem. The king of Sodom is the king of this world. And what the king of this world says to us, Hey, listen, you give me your soul, and I'll give you all the things of this world. You give me your soul, and I'll just let you have all these wonderful things. I'm going to bless you with all these things. You're going to have all these things of the world. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, What shall it profit a man if he, loses, if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And yet there's people today that are taking the things, and they are taking things from this world. They are a taker mentality, a taker mentality in their life instead of a giver mentality. All they do is take, 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 take. They never give. All they do is take. And listen, it's like they literally have sold their soul out because all they do is ever take. It sounds like some politicians, by the way. You give me your soul, I'll give you everything that you need. You, you just, hey, listen, I'll take care of you. You just give me yourself, you give yourself away, you give me your freedoms, you, you just give me that, and I'll just give you everything that you need. Listen, when people are nothing but a taker, they are always going to be under the oppression of somebody. Right. Are you listening tonight? Right. There are folks that are underneath the oppression of, this, of our society, under the oppression of the things of this world. They have literally sold themselves out for some little penance at the end of a month. Huh. There's so many examples of that. There are people today that won't get married. You know why? You know why they won't get married? Because the king of Sodom says that I'll take care of you. People today won't get married because of money. Why? Because they're going to lose some handout they've already gotten because they have a taker mentality. There are some older folks that won't get married because they're going to lose some money. There are some younger people that, that go through and learn the system of how to be a taker. They get some politician that promises them they're going to give them everything. They're getting trained by people in the community that know how to take all they can take. They learn how to not work a job and do anything. They learn the best way they can to take, 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 take. Right. You know what God said? It's more blessed to give than to receive. There are people today that are underneath the bondage of the ways of this world, the ways of Sodom, literally and the world system, because they have a taker mentality. You know what Abraham said? Hey, listen, buddy, I don't want nothing to do with that. I got something far greater than that. 
You can see that in this passage. It says here in verse number 19, and he, talking about Melchizedek, blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, a possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the most, uh, the most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies unto thine hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Later on, you read in that chapter, it says that Abraham wasn't going to give whatever he had or wasn't going to keep what he had uh, um, from Sodom because he never wanted to make it known that he was rich because of the wickedness of king, uh, the king of Sodom, because of the things of this world. He was going to rely completely upon God and God's blessings. He wasn't going to take things from this world. He wasn't going to take things that, that were taken uh, from people that were wrongfully taken. He wasn't going to be a receiver of something by some, uh, and, and let people know that he is one that is, a, I mean, literally taken care of by the, the state of Sodom. He was going to be one that was going to be taken care of by God Almighty. He wanted people to know that it was God that made him rich, not sinful man or sinful man's ways. Grasp onto that concept. And so we see here, he goes now, there's a second king, Melchizedek, the king of Salem. And what does he do to the king of Salem? Help me out. What does he do to the king of Salem? What does it say he did? He gave a tithe. Ten percent. He gave a tithe of what he had. He gave a tithe. Now that's the historical story. Abraham made a wonderful choice. It's a choice all of us ought to make. He made the choice to be a giver in life instead of a taker. Now listen, young people. I've already said it, but I want to reiterate it to you. You want to be happy in your life? You want your life to be happy? You want your life to be successful? Make up your mind to give instead of take. Make up your mind that you're going to be one that's going to be giving instead of always taking. Mom and dad never give me enough. Hmm. Start giving. Start giving. Have the giver mentality. Not the taker. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive, is what Jesus said. You see, it's the difference uh, between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. Do you realize that? I don't know if you've ever heard this illustration. I think it's a great one. What's the difference between the Sea of Galilee, which is a thriving sea that has many fish in it, people actually live off of that, and the Dead Sea? It's dead. You know what the difference is? The Sea of Galilee has an inlet and it has an outlet. There's fresh flowing water that goes through that sea all the time. You know the Dead Sea? All it has is an inlet. It just takes and takes and takes and takes. It never gives. It's dead. What kind of Christian do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? You want to be one that gives? Or do you be one that just simply all you do is receive and become dead in life? Hey, I look at people that are most unhappy in this life. It's people that are always taking and never giving. All they care about is getting something for nothing. By the way, you never get something for nothing. There's always a price to pay. You sell your soul to the devil, there's a price to pay. You sell yourself to the world system, yourself to the world system, there's always a price to pay. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 7. Amazing how we can get life application from these verses tonight. Go back to Hebrews chapter 7. Here he is, he's quoting in that first verse the historical reference that we just talked about. He points out that these, in these opening verses that Melchizedek, he has two titles. Notice them. He is a king and he is a priest. A king and a priest. Now remember, in Israel that never happened. That was something they would not allow to happen. It could not happen. A king could not be a priest. And a priest could not be a king. If you're a priest... You, were, you, you couldn't be king. If you were king, you couldn't be priest. It's kind of like what we call a separation of church and state. By the way, that's so misused in our society today. The way people apply it today, you never find it inside the Federalist letters. You never find it in the Constitution. It doesn't exist. The only thing that exists today, what they're trying to push, they're trying to say that, that there is to be no spiritual influence whatsoever in this country is what they're trying to apply that to mean. That's not what it meant. It was protection against the government uh, um, uh, putting its views and, and, and causing people to follow after some government religion that was going to keep people from worshiping God as they saw fit. Matter of fact, it was a promise to Baptist churches. If you'll read the history of it. It was the Baptist churches were a little bit concerned that they were going to be underneath the same exact tyranny as was found in the old world. And they were made a promise that the, that the government was not going to come in and, inter, and, and, and to keep them from worshiping God as they saw fit. 
It was a promise to them. It was never the other way around. Never. It's interesting. I, I got a link uh, this past, uh, I think it was two weeks ago. Um, wonderful link. Brother Tom Coleman sent it to me. It was a very interesting. If you, if you want this, let me know. It's probably something I'm going to end up showing in church. But do you realize that they used the Capitol building as a church back, back when the Founding Fathers days? They literally used it as a church. Right there. The Capitol building, they had hundreds of people that met every Sunday for church. Amazing thing. No, that's not what our country was founded on. Now, getting back to, the, to, to, the, to what we're looking at here tonight, um, we, we need to understand this. Uh, let me just say one more thing. There's nobody in this world that can tell you you can't pray, by the way. We have the freedom to be able to pray anywhere that we want to. There is nothing that says we cannot Young person, you go to a, a pu public school, you have every right to pray. There's nothing that keeps you from that. There is no law that says you cannot. And so, in Israel, they had a separation. You couldn't sit on the throne, and you couldn't be a priest at the same time. But he is saying that Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Something is different here. In Genesis chapter 14 and verse number 16, it tells us specifically that Melchizedek was a king and he was a priest. And then he goes on, uh, he goes on in, in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 2. Right in the middle of verse number 2, he says this. Notice what it says in the middle of the verse. He says, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Jesus Christ is the king of righteousness, and Jesus Christ is the king of peace. In fact, too, they come together in the Lord Jesus Christ. They literally come together. Take your Bible, turn to Psalm chapter 85, verse number 10. Look there if you would. I want you to notice it. Psalm chapter 85, look at verse number 10. Notice there what it says. Here we see a beautiful picture of what happened at the cross of Calvary when Jesus died on the cross. Notice it. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. What a beautiful verse. What a beautiful picture of when Jesus died there on the cross, righteousness and peace came together. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment, but what a wonderful thought. He is the king of righteousness. He is the king of peace. The purpose of the priest was what? What was the purpose of the priest? What was it? Communication between us and God. To go to God on our behalf. It's to get literally the people to God. To get them right with God. To bring peace to their troubled souls. That's what you need if you never received Christ as your Savior. What you need is peace. Peace. People need peace. Why do people do the things they do today? Why do people do the crazy things that they do in the world today? I mean, why do people go and shoot people? Why do people go and, I mean, literally cut themselves? Why do people take the drugs that they take today? Why do people go through all the trouble that they try to go through to try to find happiness? Hey, listen, the reason why people are in that situation today is because people are looking for peace. They're looking for peace. Listen, you're not going to get peace until you get righteousness. Understand that. Those two words that go together. For us to have peace... We must have righteousness. Now that presents a problem, doesn't it? Because there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us, we're in a bad, bad position. We can't have peace unless we have righteousness. And we can't have righteousness unless we have Jesus Christ as our Savior. Jesus Christ is the answer. Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 1, it says this, Therefore being justified by faith. Therefore being justified by faith. That is being declared righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore being justified by faith. That means I have been proclaimed righteous through Jesus Christ. And then the verse goes on, it says, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that. The words, it's, it's always righteousness and then peace. Always, mark it down. You must have righteousness before you will ever have peace. Before I was saved, there was no peace. Before I was saved, even as a child, I didn't have peace when I went to bed at night. I didn't have peace in my heart of knowing where I was going. 
I was afraid that I would go to hell. Hey, listen, without righteousness, there is no peace. And if you want peace in your soul, then you need the imparted righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he paid for you on the cross of Calvary. So he is the king of righteousness. He literally is our righteousness. He is the king of peace. He literally is our peace. Not only that, but notice verse number three. It says he is a priest. It, 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 uh, it says also it, that he was a priest without father and without mother. Without father, without mother. Who is that talking about once again? Okay, it's talking about Jesus. It's a picture of. But it, this is a reference to Melchizedek. Now, how could that be a reference of Melchizedek? That's interesting. Now, Melchizedek was a picture of Christ, so that's the right answer. But it's talking here. He's literally using an illustration in the Bible of Melchizedek to illustrate Jesus Christ. You go back in Genesis chapter 14, there's no mention made of his father or mother. That's what it's talking about. There was no mention of that. It says, without descent, in verse number 7 in our text. In other words, there was no genealogy given of Melchizedek. It also says, having neither beginning of days nor the end of days. And, and we're not told when he was born or when he died. This is referring back to Melchizedek. But literally, once again, all of that is pointing to Jesus Christ. It's pointing to the fact that Jesus Christ had no beginning of days. He has a superior priesthood because Jesus Christ did not die. You say, hang on a minute. Didn't he die? Did Christ die for our sins? Yes, he did. Is Christ eternal? Yes, he is. He literally stepped out from eternity into the timeline of mankind he lived his life here on this earth. He died a physical death for us, died in our place. He didn't stay dead, though. He rose again the third day, and he lives forevermore. Jesus Christ, he is better than the priests. Jesus Christ is eternal. Jesus Christ is for all eternity. And so Jesus Christ, we see here, it speaks of a matter of titles. He was the king of peace, and he was the king of righteousness. I want for us to look at the second matter uh, that we see here tonight in these verses. The second, Roman numeral two, if you're taking notes, is the matter of tithes. Tithes. In verses four through, through ten, he talks about this whole complicated matter of tithes. I think it would be helpful for us to understand the matter of tithing, for us to understand what this is talking about tonight. By the way, our church has always taught tithing. It's something from the very foundation of our church. It's something that has been taught throughout the years. It is something that, that uh, is preached from the Word of God, the area of tithing. We believe in tithing. But you'll notice that he makes it very clear that there is a difference between the tithes that were given under the law and those that, that, or that was required under the law and the tithes that Abraham gave. Grab onto this tonight. This is very interesting. Look at verse number 5. He says, and verily they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to, what does it say? Take tithes. The Levites under the priesthood had a command to take the tithes from the people. It was commanded for them to take it according to the law. It was something that was the law that it was taken from the, the people. The Jews, they did not give tithes. It was taken from them. There's a big dif difference between taking and giving. Amen. Big difference. Listen, they paid their tithes. It was a command. Now, let me give you a summary on this area of tithing. If you've gone through discipleship, letter M gives the same summary, but I want to give it to you once again. All right? This will wrap the whole subject of tithing up in the Bible. If you want to take notes, write this down. Number one, on the area of tithing, Abraham commenced it. He commenced it. It all started with Abraham back in Genesis chapter 14. We read about it tonight. That's the first time that it's mentioned. Number two, Moses, he, uh, he, he um, codified it. Leviticus chapter 27, verses 30 through 32. He put it in code. There's laws that he put down that God told him to put down. All right, Moses, he put it into code. He put it into law. It was requirement for them to tithe. You didn't give it. They took it. You paid it. You were required by law to pay it. Number three, Malachi commanded it. Now, let, me, let me, before I go on further, when you think about taking, does the IRS, do you give to the IRS or do they take it? 
Okay, that's the distinction. Now you understand the difference? It's not hard to figure that out. I don't volunteer anything to the IRS. Right, amen. All right, praise God. All right, Malachi, he commanded it. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, it says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Now let's go on to the New Testament. Number four, Jesus commended it. Matthew chapter 23, verse number 23, he commended it. You say, hang on a minute, though. He was, he was talking about those that gave tithes were doing it all wrong, and it was wrong for them to do it. No, you've got to read the end of that verse. He says it was right that they did tithe, but they were giving for the wrong reason. They were doing it all for the wrong way. They were doing it for their own self-glory, but he commended it. He didn't say it was wrong. There was other things that Jesus did say were wrong, but he never said it about tithing. Jesus Christ, he commended it. He says, these ought ye have done. In other words, you should have done these things, but you should have done it with the right heart, the right way, for the right reason, not for your own self-glory. It's something you should have done just because it was the law, but not so you can get the glory. So Jesus commends the tithe. And then Paul, he continued the tithe. We're talking about New Testament. Now we're talking about the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, the verse says this, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath purposed him. As God hath pur uh, pur purposed, uh, excuse me, prospered him. I know that didn't sound right. Had prospered him. Now that word there, as God hath prospered him, that's a clear implication of a percentage. A clear implication that summarizes the whole matter, though, of tithing, those points as we look at that. And let me tell you how we should tithe. We ought to tithe not according to the law. I don't pay a tithe. You shouldn't have to pay a tithe. We are to give our tithes, like Abraham gave his tithe. Notice the difference. Verse number 5, the Levitical priesthood had a command to take the tithes. But in verse number 2, it says, To whom also Abraham, what's the word? What does it say? Gave. Abraham gave. It wasn't taken from him. Abraham gave. It was voluntary. Abraham, he had no law to command him to give a tithe. It's just something that came voluntary from his heart, out of a heart of gratefulness. Listen, that's the way that we are to give. That's the way that we are to tithe. I believe that we should tithe, and I believe it's a very good place to start with our giving. In fact, it's inconceivable to me that Christians under grace would give less than the Jewish law commanded to give. Think about the grace that we have. You say, well, mean preacher, you mean we don't have to give? No, you don't have to give. But you can understand this. God has set precedence in his word that we're going to reap what we sow. And God has set precedent in his word that we should tithe. But God loves a cheerful giver. He doesn't just take it out of your paycheck every week. It's something that we do because of God's grace, because of His love. It's something we do out of a heart of gratefulness that we would give willingly, give cheerfully. And by the way, I don't make any apology tonight when I talk about giving. When I talk about giving fervently, when I talk about giving, I don't make any apology about even asking for an extra offering or to talk about missions giving. By the way, listen, I'm teaching you the joy of being a giver instead of a taker. A lot of folks understand that when it comes to the things of the world. I would never take anything. I mean, I'll go out and work for it. But they'll come sit in a pew and never pay a dime for the lights to be on. Oh, people are dying and going to hell. They'll never put a dime inside the plate to help pay for what's going on here and, and for missionaries. Are you all with me today? You say, preacher, now you're trying to make me feel bad, so I give. No, I'm just trying to tell you that it's more blessed to give than to receive. I'm trying to share with you that if you'll give from the right heart, it's going to be a joyful thing for you. It's going to be an encouraging thing for you. It's going to be a blessing thing for you. God, yes, he will bless you for that. God's not going to make you do it. No more than I can make my 15-year-old do anything, but there are consequences to actions. There are. Understand that tonight. But God wants us to give out of a grateful heart. Look at verse number 4. Notice, not only did he give a tithe, but notice what it says there. Look at verse number 4. It says, Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. The spoils. That word there, spoils, it literally means off the top. Off the top. He gave off the top. That simply means that he gave God first. Listen, that's the way that you and I ought to give as well. We ought to give God first. Let me ask you, what happens if you don't give God first? What happens? What if you don't give God first? 
What would you say, Elena? You're probably not going to give it to God at all. If we don't give God first, by the end you, get through, you go through and you say, well, God would understand. I mean, I have to pay my bills, right? Who's responsible for paying your bills? Who? God is. But I have to pay this, I have to pay that. Listen, I found in my life, if you don't pay first God, it's not there at the end. It's not there. God wants us to give Him first. Amen. Tithing is a beginning. God wants us to give first. God wants us to give Him first place in our life. Look at verse number 7 and 8. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom is the witness that he liveth. Those are some interesting verses in the previous verse and, then, and all, all the way down to verse number 10. It's speaking of some interesting things here. I want to look at there. Look at verse number 9. Let's go ahead and read it again. It says, And as I may say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham. How did he do that? For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. That's interesting. What, what is that talking about there? His point is this. The Levites were in the loins of Abraham. They literally came from Abraham. We know how that everybody, every one of us, uh, genetically, we can trace our, our family lineage back to our father and his father and his father and his father all the way back. And so you literally were in the loins of your great, 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 great grandfather and go all the way back. We were literally it, it, genetically... You existed genetically. The point is that Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. The Levitical priesthood who took tithes and Abraham, they gave tithes as well through him. And so he's saying that the less is, 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 that, that the less is blessed by the better. Who's the less in this picture? Who's the less? The less is the ones that gave out of duty. The less is the Levites, the ones that gave they were blessed by the better. Who was the better? Their father Abraham that gave out of a heart of gratitude. The less is better. That's not talking about what they gave either. It's talking about the motive for which they gave. It's talking about the blessings they received as a result of that. This passage of scripture is basically saying to us that Jesus Christ is a superior priest. He is our priest king. He is a king of peace. He is the king of righteousness. He is a priest that is better than all the other priests. You don't need an earthly priest anymore. You don't have to have an earthly priest. You have a better priest in him. You have a superior priest in him. Not, not after the order of Aaron. Not after the order of the Levites. But after the order of Melchizedek. Which literally was a picture of Jesus Christ himself. That's how God does things. God, he presented a picture of himself in the Old Testament to make preparation for his coming. Over and over again we see that. Then we see the fulfillment of that prophecy. We see it in Jesus Christ. We see it in Christ. You know, I praise God that I can look back now to Calvary and know that Christ finished the work for me. He became sin so that I could know righteousness. He became sin for me so that I could have peace with God. I praise God for that tonight. And because what God has done for us, we ought to be willing to give. It ought to be something that we do out of a cheerful heart. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed as we pray. Lord, thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning in the area of missions. Thank you for the commitment that was made. Would I thank you tonight for speaking to our hearts. Lord, for giving us peace. And Lord, that peace came at a price. It came at the price of you dying on the cross for our sins, that we might have your righteousness. Lord, I pray tonight that you would challenge our hearts. Lord, it might be in the area of tithing. It might be in the area of giving cheerfully. Lord, it might be in the area tonight of not having peace in our life as a result of living in a life of unrighteousness. Lord, challenge our hearts. Speak to us now, I pray.